All right, hello and welcome everybody to this exciting uh, discussion. Uh, we're joined by some fantastic guests and I'm just gonna go in order of who I'm seeing on my screen currently. So uh, Stephanie, how are you? Would you, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, who you are? Sure. Do you want me to do my full five minutes or just say a quick intro? We're going to do a quick intro first and then we can go into it. Sure. Um, my name is Stephanie Slade. I'm the managing editor at Reason Magazine. And I also contribute to a variety of other places, including America Magazine, which is a Catholic magazine. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Tim Andrews, who is part of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance gang, uh, would you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, you know what, Tim? Oh, there you go. Sorry, we're muted. Um, so I'm Tim. I'm just here to, in the capacity to assist with the moderation and questions and answers so that Emilio doesn't have to do all of the work. Um, I'm, I was the founder of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, now here in DC. And I'll do, do a few more introductory remarks just before we start the sessions. But Sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. All right. Uh, Judd, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Judd Weiss. I have been in the Liberty scene since high school, it's been a while, so I, I be active. And I'm mostly known in the Liberty Movement for uh, taking a lot of photos of, of libertarians and trying to make them look cool, of, uh, of parties, uh, fundraisers for Liberty causes uh, many, many over the years. So uh, I've been a long time active in the space. Sounds good, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Carrie, can you tell us a bit about I, you? Yeah, uh, I'm Carrie Baldwin. Uh, I'm an independent researcher and writer with a degree in philosophy. I have my own website called mereliberty.com and a podcast called Dare to Think. And I'm also a uh, contributor at the Libertarian Christian Institute. Lovely. Thank you so much. So I'm going to throw it to Tim now to give us a great intro into what is an uncontroversial topic, which very few people have strong opinions about. Tim, <laughs> please take it away. Thank you. And look, a huge thank you to Emilio for helping facilitate this and also, though, to our speakers and our panellists, because this is such a difficult question. And I know that almost every year when we've had the Friedman Conference in person, and Judd, I know you've attended one in Australia in the past, people have always said, can we discuss the issue of, you know, whether the, the differences between pro-life and pro-choice libertarians? And it's such a heated and passionate issue for so many people. And the Friedman Conference was always very much about trying to build a united liberty community where different people can get together in good faith, that we were always sort of shied away from that debate because we thought it could be so sort of rancorous. Um, that we've decided this year to try and demonstrate, and using the examples of the three speakers we have with us of how this is a debate that can be had in good faith amongst friends. It's an issue that people are deeply passionate about, that sort of goes very much, that libertarians can, of good faith can disagree with each other on, that rather than trying to engage in a sort of Facebook thread of doom of sort of 1,000 comments in 25 minutes of everyone insulting each other, to sort of demonstrate how you can still sympathize and empathize with each other's view, and come to a different conclusion, despite having very fundamentally similar first principles. And I know that Stephanie has you know, previously done a debate with, with um, I think Elizabeth Nolan Brown on reason, specifically on this exact issue as to how you can disagree on good faith, on pro-choice and pro-life issues. Kerry in her debate with Walter Block recently, and I think everyone who knows Judd knows that also he's somebody who, is passionate is the beliefs, but also bends over backwards to work with other people and to try and understand their viewpoints and to come at them again in a position of good faith. So what we're going to do is each speaker is going to speak for about five minutes and introduce their positions. We're then going to have some moderated Q&A, both questions that I'll ask, but in addition to that, and um, please, there's a chat function here, if you will start putting questions to speakers into chat. I would also say, I'm glad that people are already making comments in chat and um, having prejudged people's positions without actually having read or listened to any of their comments. So I'm glad certain people here are definitely coming in with an open mind. But hopefully um, 
you'll actually be able to engage with the arguments in good faith. So to, to start the, the, the debate, uh, sorry, the discussion, I think our panelists are actually quite clear that this isn't a debate, it's a discussion amongst friends. Um, Stephanie, if you would like to sort of speak about your work, views for a couple of minutes. Sure, thank you. Um, so my general position on the question of where libertarians should come down on the issue of abortion um, is that the libertarian position on abortion is contingent. Um, it depends whether you believe that abortion is an action that involves one human being or two human beings, one set of uh, rights or two sets of rights in conflict with each other. Um, you know, to the extent that we as libertarians believe that there is any legitimate role for the state at all, uh, at the very top of the list of legitimate functions uh, is going to be that the state, should, you know, exists to uh, punish and discourage the taking of innocent human life, right? So the question, though, the, the disagreement is, does abortion qualify as the taking of an innocent human life? Um, and again, so in order to, to sort of get at that question, you have to, you have to, ha you know, you have to know what life is and when does it begin. Um, Another thing I want to say up front is that I am a fairly thin libertarian. That is to say, I believe libertarianism is a political philosophy. It's a, a philosophy about the proper role of state in society. Um, state being unique in the literal sense of that word. It is the entity that Max Weber famously defined as having a monopoly on the use of violence. Um, and so uh, libertarianism is, is dealing with that question. Um, what libertarianism can't do though, is answer questions about things like, when does life begin? Uh, what is personhood? When do the rights associated with, you know, human life inhere in a new human being? Uh, it just, it doesn't have anything to offer on those questions, in my view. Uh, in order to answer those questions, you have to look elsewhere, look outside of the libertarian political philosophy. You can look at a variety of things. You can look at science. You can look at religion, if you have religion. You can look at tradition, at personal experience. Experience. You can consult your intuitions, um, but you have to begin by answering the question of, again, what is life? When does it start? Whether the act of abortion involves one person or two. And from there, then, you can sort of put on your libertarian hat and apply libertarian political philosophy and answer questions about whether or not the state should get involved. Um, as for me, I, I look at an ultrasound and I see a baby, a human life. And as a result, I identify as pro-life. Um, and I look forward with hope to a future in which the culture will sort of agree with me on that, will reflect that position. A future in which the culture sees abortion as unthinkable. Um, and yes, a future in which the laws reflect that. Um, that said, I also believe fairly strongly that the change has to happen in that order cultural change followed by legal change, not the other way around. So when I speak to pro-life activists, um, I always encourage them to focus their energy and attention on changing hearts and minds, not on trying to change the law. Uh, because if you, I mean, the sort of hard won lessons that we as libertarians all respect in all other aspects of society about how legal policy and prohibition has unintended consequences and often very horrific unintended consequences, those lessons don't cease to apply uh, and, just because this is, in my view, an issue of life, life or death. So you have to do it in the right order. Um, I think that is important. Um, and for some people, perhaps that makes me a total squish and not even a true pro-lifer. I, I disagree, though. I think I am. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I think that, you know, we have, to be, we have to be practical about how we go about accomplishing our goals. Um, and so that's, that's sort of my general position on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So now for a very sort of contrary opinion, uh, Jeb. So I thought that what Stephanie just said there was excellent. And I agree with everything she said up until right after when she says she sees a baby. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, so up until uh, right when she says she sees a baby and that she hopes that it would be unconscionable that the people uh, would, would have an abortion. Um, she's completely right. Libertarianism doesn't answer this question, whether this is right or wrong, whether we should uh, uh, have abortions, whether it should be legal, because liber liberty is about protecting the liberties of humans, and it's, it's human liberty, and it's individual liberty. 
And the question is, is, is the baby itself an individual or the fetus? Or uh, is, is the, does the individual rights fall on the mother? And as far as I'm concerned, um, I respect that that's open for debate among people. And I, and I respect that people have a difference of opinion on that. Um, but I don't, uh, my, my perspective is, I don't think it's an individual uh, that, that babies have individual rights or fetuses have individual rights until they are born, until they are separate, they're not separate or individual. Uh, you, you can remove, there's, there's interesting uh, talk, talks about evictionism where you could just separate the baby from your, uh, the fetus from yourself and now uh, let it live. And I actually don't agree with that. I believe that if, as, as long as you are an individual and anything is within, within inside you and feeding off of you, uh, you have a right to end it, whether it's a fetus or some sort of organism that came in or, or a little, some sort of little creature, you can kill it if you want to. Uh, of course, you should be conscientious of the fact that a fetus is a potential human life and a potential individual human life. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, as where this applies with liberty, uh, we should not bring government into this decision. People do have a legitimate reason to believe that a fetus could have rights, and personally, as long as they don't impose that on others or they, they could think that it's unconscionable and wrong, but as long as they don't impose those views on others and uh, use the force of government, I'm all for it. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with the difference. And we're having a discussion here. It's not meant to be a total debate. I think Stephanie outlined that really well, and I completely, I'm completely on board with it. And she does see a baby in an ultrasound, and I agree with her because it's a fetus. It is developing into a baby. But it's not, it's, not a, it's not an individual human being with individual rights until it's separated at birth. And that's the difference. No, you don't have to agree. I'll, I'll, my only position is let's just agree to disagree and leave government out of this. Okay. Thank you, Chad. And so to our third contributor, um, Kerry. Thank you very much. Um, I want to... Um, uh, First of all, thank you again for, for having me on. I'm really excited about this discussion and already I'm, I'm hearing some things that I think will make this, this, this discussion really worthwhile. Um, I, you know, I came at this uh, issue from uh, a more typical pro-lifer position several years ago. I grew up in the, in the movement. Um, I, you know, made the, the moral arguments. I, uh, rationalize women's decisions. I, I did all those sorts of things. And though I've never had an abortion, I have experienced many of the problems that women cite for reasons why they do have abortions. And so I feel like I can empathize a little bit um, or empathize really a, quite a bit with pro with pro-choicers and the reasonings why they um, why they choose to um, and why they want to have abortion uh, remain legal. Um, but I am still pro-life and um, I, I, I decided that it was, it was time to sort of rehash this, right? And so how I come about this is starting to rethink about it in terms of property rights. And so I take a Rothbardian approach, which is um, you know, that, that human rights are, are based in property rights and that we're self owners. And, um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the position that we start with. And what we find is that this is a very complex issue. And so I've, I've, uh, distinguished it in, in three different ways. You have a le legal philosophical, uh, aspect, which is talking about natural rights, whether a woman has a right to abort, whether the fetus has a right to life. You have the legal enforcement aspect, which is just the adjudication of disputes and rights violations and, and enforcements and how that would play out. And then you have the praxeological or the economic aspect, which is the woman actually making a choice, uh, whether it's legal or not. So, um, Taking those three, those three aspects, you could summarize my position this way. 
first of all, um, I actually disagree with both Judd and Stephanie. I do think libertarian philosophy, um, according to Rothbard's view on property, right, or property rights, unequivocally supports the idea that the fetus is a self-owner from conception, and science does support this, and that fetal self-ownership and the woman's self-ownership are not actually at odds. Uh, now, this does preclude abortion as a natural right, um, but we still need to work through and reconcile um, how, uh, the, how fetal rights and a woman's rights um, can be absolute and, and, and interact in, in the uh, you know, same space at the same time. Then you have the enforcement aspect, and I think really this is where a lot of the disagreement lies. Uh, the conventional pro-life view, uh, or the conservative pro-life view, I like to call it, uh, really doesn't have a problem with the authoritarian enforcement of abortion prohibition. And uh, I'm deeply opposed to that. Um, you know, I don't want to see a prohibition of abortion enforced like the war on drugs. I don't want, you know, I, I don't want to see tough on crime policies uh, applied in those cases. Not only do I think that's harmful to the woman and can uh, can entrap innocent women in in that whole process, but tough on crime legislation has proven to be ineffective even when it comes to violent crime. Um, so I oppose an authoritarian enforcement of abortion prohibition. I think a libertarian enforcement uh, can avoid the dr the draconian nature of authoritarianism. And then finally, I do believe that a real quote, excuse me, real quote end to abortion uh, comes from uh, or rests in the economic aspect um, where we're innovating and making available a myriad of life affirming options for, for women, uh, which I hope to get into, you know, as we go along. And the way I see the uh, the division between pro-life and pro-choice is really more of, uh, should, should be seen by libertarians more as a specialization of labor. You have a segment of society that's motivated to prevent unwanted pregnancies, and you have a se segment that's motivated to provide life-affirming options when unwanted pregnancies occur. Um, so I don't, I don't uh, live under the illusion that we can rid ourselves of unwanted pregnancies. I think they'll always exist. Um, but I do see a way where both sides can can work together from the economic aspect. Okay, so just reading some of the questions that people are sending me already. But before I, I think I go to questions, I was wondering, both Judd and Stephanie, since I think Kerry's position spoke last, sort of disagree, had challenges to both of your positions. If, you, if, if either of you wish to have a quick sort of right of reply, so with your comments, so starting with you, John. Because it's interesting that Kerry in particular is going to this up from a property rights sort of Rothbardian perspective. Sure, I just want to clarify with Kerry. Uh, did you say that you don't believe that government should enforce uh, abortion laws? I don't believe in an authoritarian enforcement. So I don't think that, I don't think that we should have you know, a lot of the proposals from the pro-life side now, that, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly Republican, uh, they don't mind employing tactics that are used in the war on drugs. In fact, there's uh, a very prominent pro-lifer who has said a war on abortion would look like the war on drugs. And I think that's absolutely not the way to go. So I don't support an authoritarian uh, enforcement of abortion prohibition. So then would abortion be criminal and, and have to face penalties? Well, sure. You can. I mean, a libertarian legal order would would have an enforcement uh, uh, situation, um, but you're talking about more of those those classical liberal principles, like you know, presum the presumption of innocence, being secure in your person uh, and property, um, due process, and you know, I think one of the most important things is that you can't be accused merely on suspicion, which is something that we do get from the war on drugs. Um, but we couldn't have abortion clinics and we couldn't have open uh, open discussion that I did have an abortion and I didn't think it was wrong. We couldn't admit to it, but it would be criminal. I'm just trying to understand, what you, when you said non-authoritarian, do you mean that it's criminal and punishable by law? 
and that they will, people will be prevented legally from doing it. I'm, I'm saying that in a, in a libertarian legal order, it is conceivable that abortion could be uh, considered criminal and, and enforced. Um, and I don't think that that precludes uh, talking about uh, abortion or things like that. It doesn't preclude talking about it, but it precludes doing it. So, sure, uh, sure, sorry. it precludes okay, doing I, it. I get it. So if it is if it is criminal, it does seem like it's going to fall under authority. So it would be an authoritarian approach. If we're going to use no. authority to prevent that. No. So how do you define authoritarian? I, I mean, there's there's degrees of of. Are we just discussing degrees? Because if, if the authority is going to ban clinics, punish people that have uh, uh, abortions, then that's I don't know, I, I, it's just a degree of authoritarianism. So are you saying that a libertarian legal order is authoritarian? Um, if, there's a, if there's authority and there's a monopoly of force in a limited geographic region and there, uh, yeah there's an authoritarian uh, use of force against the use of force to protect rights uh, I'm, I'm okay with that for 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 uh, crimes of violence and uh, theft but I, I think I got it that you agree that this would be criminal and this this that the government has a right to prevent this prevent abortions from occurring prevent uh, clinics from conducting abortions, and prevent people from openly choosing to have abortions openly. Is that right? Well, yeah, that would be, I mean, okay. we don't we, we don't allow open murder. Like even right. in a libertarian legal order, we wouldn't allow okay. for- Okay, so then that's, we're, we're and I said at the beginning, we can agree to disagree, but let's not get the government involved with it. We do agree, we actually do disagree whether the government will be involved. I'm, I'm okay with people taking a pro-life stance personally and even preaching it and teaching it and, and protesting even, but I'm against people uh, interfering with people's right to, to have an abortion. And I think that is a fundamental human right. So well, Kerry, uh, sorry, yeah, Kerry um, a number of people have asked in the comments if you could elaborate, and we want Stephanie to end it shortly also, that Kerry, a number of people have asked what specifically, when you say a libertarian legal order, what, what your conception of that is and how that's different to the current legal system that we operate under. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, first, first you have to start off with, with what are rights, right? And that's where Rothbard comes in and, and he says that rights are based in self-ownership. And you have, uh, you have uh, two criteria that Rothbard gives uh, for self-ownership. One, you have to be a human being. And two, you have to have possession of your own body. And both Hans Hermann Hoppe and Stefan Kinsella have elaborated on what it means to have possession of your own body. And that is uh, what Hoppe calls the objective link. And it just means direct and immediate control over yourself. And so... Uh, that's where we start is is with human rights and self-ownership and then you have the non-aggression principle so you cannot initiate force against other people um, that you know that includes violence killing um, and there's there's a process of adjudication for that now whether you're talking about a limited government like a minarchist society or you're talking about an anarchist society there are uh, currently uh, different viewpoints on how that might play out, but they're all based on the same basic principles of, uh, you know, the, the classical liberalism that you have a presumption of innocence, uh, you need evidence in order to charge, um, you have due process, you, you have a right to be secure in your person, th those sorts of things. So yes, there would be a legal order, whether you're in a minarchist society or an anarchist society, but it's based on Self, you know, the principle of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle. I think uh, I completely agree with what Stephanie said, is that this really comes down to whether your human rights begin at conception or do they begin at birth? Uh, and the libertarian philosophy won't answer that. You, uh, Kerry said 
that it's backed up by science that um, human rights begin at, birth, at conception. And I, I, I don't, that, that's a, a further discussion. But for the sake of this topic, I don't agree. And we can, we can get into the details why, but as far as I'm concerned, it's really clear. We have individual rights and they become uh, uh, individual rights when we are individuals. And we're not an individual uh, when we're just a couple of cells developing. And eventually we will develop into a, a more fully formed fetus that resembles a baby and, and, and soon we will be a separate baby. But until that happens, uh, I don't believe that we are we have individual rights that any rights pertain to a fetus whatsoever and we could go into that and really dive in that that's a moral discussion potentially a scientific discussion but there's also the economic discussion and then there's a personal um, impact discussion you know uh, what what uh, unplanned pregnancies can totally ruin people's lives and put them in get them involved with other people that they really don't want to be involved with for the rest of their lives uh, and create a lot of unfortunate circumstances from a personal perspective. From an economics perspective, we can just multiply those, those, uh, those individual stories of unplanned pregnancies, how they ruin and deviate people's lives. And I think that a moral society should focus on the living, uh, the mother, the, the, the people that are actually here in this world that are individuals, and the lives that they're trying to uh, to provide for themselves. I do not believe in any way that that uh, fetuses have some sort of moral right to, to life or any rights whatsoever in any shape or form. And that's a real a serious discussion, but what I can say is we can agree to disagree on that. I just don't want government to be involved in this matter. So, Judd, so, uh, I'm sorry, your, your comments have elicited a number of questions for a few speakers um, that I just want to read, read out because I want to feel our audi audience to be a little bit involved. And the first one just is um, what you were saying earlier, and the question is to Stephanie. Um, that, Stephanie, you said earlier that, that if you accept that it's life, the government then has a role to be involved. And the comment that you made was you have to look at things outside of libertarianism. And you said as well as science, you also mentioned religion and intuition as things that could potentially guide your view as to whether or not this is acceptable for state action. And the question is that because issues can I, can such I as- step, Let me just interrupt sure. you. That is, that is definitely not what I said. What I said was that libertarianism talks about the proper role for state action. The question of when life begins or when personhood or the, the rights associated with personhood um, in here in a person, um, that is a thing that you have to look outside okay. of libertarianism to answer science, religion, intuition, experience, tr tradition. I mean, these are, these are the other, the, and, and other things too, I'm sure there are others. Um, those are the things that you have to look to outside of the political philosophy of libertarianism to answer the question of when life begins or when, I think there's a little bit of a, of a goal post moving that happens um, among pro-choicers, which is they used, the debate used to be very clear. They, de they insisted with, with like, you know, categorically, life does not begin at conception. And now it seems to be, well, life may or may not. I mean, sure, maybe it's life, but it's not personhood. And then it's like, well, maybe, there, maybe it's a person, and, but it doesn't have rights yet. I mean, there's, a, there's this sort of evolution in the argument among pro-choicers that I've noticed over, over the years. Um, whatever it is that we want to talk about as the thing that matters. If you want to say it's the point at which the rights inhere in the person, that's fine. The question is, does it happen at conception? Does it happen at birth? Does it happen at some point after birth? Occasionally you'll get a person arguing that infanticide is actually totally morally acceptable because a, an infant is no more of a person than is a fetus. I think that that's going a bit, that's, that's a hard to defend position. Um, but then also, I think the idea that, that the sort of right status changes magically after the, you know, because of the passage through the birth canal is also pretty hard to defend. And then you have to ask yourself, well, is, there, is it possible that there's some point in between conception and birth um, that where, where the, you know, there have, been, there have been lots of people who have put forward idea, uh, theories or and even in our legal system suggests that um, the point at which the, the, the baby or the fetus can survive outside of the woman, the woman's body. Um, if it were to be born premature, could it be kept alive and survive and develop into an adult 
that that's the relevant question. Um, you have to sort of interrogate each of these positions and, and try to answer the question of when is, what is the point at which the rights um, and the per of the personhood, you know, suddenly become ap applicable. And, and, you know, you have to bring all those things that I talked about earlier to, to, to bear in that task. Um, and I, I've done that and I've, I've um, found that I find it, I find it's very difficult actually when you begin to interrogate the different options they there's through a process of elimination i think you almost have to end up at conception so that's where that's where i come down and but i encourage everybody to bring all the things that matter to them again if your religion isn't my religion you, you're, you're going to apply that differently if you don't have religion at all then you're not going to apply that at all but you have to sort of ask yourself what is the point at which you know a person is a person with rights that's the question that has to be answered and that's the thing that libertarianism cannot cannot weigh in on the thing the question about once we know what a person what, when a person is a person whether the government sh has some sort of duty to protect the innocent life then i think is a thing that libertarianism absolutely exists to answer that question and and it's pretty uh it's it's pretty uncontroversial actually um i mean again i, I always put it this way to the extent that you believe that government has any legitimate role at all so if you are a true anarchist who believes there is no legitimate role for government then you're not even going to say the government should outlaw murder, okay. Um, but to the extent that you believe government has any legitimate role at all, you probably believe that you know outlawing murder is first on the list. And so, if once we can establish that, you know, this is an innocent human life, uh, then libertarianism does have something to say about that question. So I completely agree with Stephanie and her point about uh, we have to figure out when do rights uh, begin. I just disagree that it's difficult to defend it. It's when uh, a fetus passes through the birth canal. That's exactly when I believe that rights begin. Life begins before that. I, I, I don't think that that's really controversial. A fetus, uh, you could have a C-section and, and, a, and a baby, a, a fetus could, the preemies, preemies live. So there's, th that's not really debatable. This is a, uh, a developing human life. That's not debatable. It's what, what is debatable is when do the rights begin? And she's taken the position that it begins at conception. And I, I actually understand why somebody might think that. I'm taking the position that it begins upon birth, that when a fetus passes through the birth canal is when it becomes a separate individual. And not until it becomes a separate individual does it have individual rights. Does it become a baby? It went from a fetus to an actual individual baby. Uh, it, it, it didn't change biologically. It changed in the fact that it's no longer a part of something else. If some, if, if, uh, and I'm male, and it's, it's interesting that, you know, there's a team up here of two females on me, when it's usually uh, women arguing for pro-choice. Um, but, but nevertheless, if I, I can't have birth, but if something got inside me, I have a right to remove it, uh, whether it's a uh, bacteria, some sort of parasite, some sort of creature. Uh, I can kill it before I remove it. It's my body, and I'm going to do what I want with my body. And I believe there's, it shouldn't be that controversial that a, an actual individual human, uh, their life supersedes anything within it that's currently feeding off of it or existing inside in any way. I think that shouldn't be controversial. I understand that it is, and I sympathize and I empathize with that. And I'm totally okay with, with the fact that people have that opinion. I'm, I'm just not okay with bringing government into it. I think it's, this is a matter where we should agree to disagree when it comes to the government uh, enforcement of, on abortion. Um, and before, Kerry, before I pose the follow-up question to you, Judd, I do want to say thank you for this sort of bravery that you, we did try and get two on two speakers and then you're both single-handedly defending one side of the argument and also with the odd and unusual structure of, you know, two fem uh, females but on the pro-life side versus one male on the pro-choice side. So thank you, Judd, for when we were discussing this in the, in the organisation for being such a good sport about it. Um, but Kerry, the, the question then once again goes to what you were saying earlier, and I think what Judd was just talking about, which is the role of government here. And I still think quite a few people are asking us for more of a clarification as how on the one hand, Kerry, you can say you're opposed to authoritarian enforcement, but yet you still believe that 
even in a libertarian order, it's still a criminal act the government should intervene in, and even in a more anarcho-capitalist society, that would still be enforced somehow. And a few people are still, and I think Judd was trying to get at this earlier, a few people are still asking for you to tease that out a little bit more. Sure. So when I say authoritarian, I'm talking about a Hobbesian view of government, which is the idea that uh, human beings are uh, not good enough to make decisions on their own, and so they need somebody to make decisions for them, i.e. a government. So uh, when I say authoritarian, I'm talking about systems of government where they are telling you um, beyond just, you know, you can't murder because even libertarians say you can't murder. Uh, so, um, but, you know, you can't um, drive your car without a license. You can't go outside without a mask. You can't, um, you know, use any other currency but the one that's, that's dictated to you. That's authoritarianism. And it comes in many forms. Um, we know uh, the more uh, dictatorial forms, which are, you know, communism, fascism, um, and then even some more, some of the more kinder ones like classical republicanism and even democracy. But a libertarian legal order is unique from that because it only criminalizes uh, rights violations. And um, so, you know, we do have to establish where rights begin. And that was the whole reason why Rothbard used property rights. And so he does establish, the libertarian philosophy does establish where those rights come from, where they begin. And that's the, the two criteria. You have to be human and you have to have self-possession. Now, I want to say something more about um, the science that supports that because what Rothbard does is he says, okay, these are the criteria. Now we have to look at the facts of nature. Um, and, um, you know, biology already categorizes the zygote, which is the product of conception, as being a living, organi living organism with a human differentiation. And that's based on six criterion that they use for living organisms. Um, and then according to human embryology, and there are two studies that, that I cite in this, the zygote is autonomous and self-organizing. Um, so how does this work? Well, I mean, obviously, the unfertilized egg is under the uh, is under maternal direction, right? It's it's the maternal DNA that is giving instruction to the uh, to the unfertilized egg. But after fertilization, you have the process of conception, which takes three days, and during that time, and science can show this, there is a transition. It's called a, a uh, mater uh, maternal zygote uh, transition, where the genetic um, directions from the uh, fr from the maternal DNA taper off, and the genetic directions from the zygote um, turn on, so that once you get once you get to the end of that three days and conception is complete, uh, fetal development is completely self-driven by the fetus. Um, the other thing that that has been found is that embryonic remodeling, which occurs at implantation that's also completely self-driven. So the creation of the umbilical cord, the creation of the placenta, that's, that's baby's creation. Um, so, so by the facts of nature, uh, Rothbard's two criteria for self-ownership obtained for the fetus, and therefore the fetus must have rights according to libertarian philosophy. Now, as far as enforcement is concerned, when I talk about um, authoritarian enforcement, um, I'm talking about the practices that we use right now, which are tough on crime policies and the war on drugs. And there's no reason in the world why we can't have a legal order that doesn't use those. Those only came into play back in the 70s and 80s. Okay, and there's more than enough data from Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom that those sorts of policies uh, are counterproductive for even the violent crimes that they're intended for. So we don't need to use those, those sorts of enforcements. Um, and some of the enforcements that have already been discussed, you know, Stefan Kinsella has, has sort of an eye for an eye view. Uh, Bob Murphy has more of a pacifist view. 
Um, I'm more partial to a restorative justice view and um, I don't know if, uh, if the audience is familiar with, but Matt Kibbe and the guys over at Free the People recently released an award-winning documentary explaining how restorative justice works. So there are many different ways that we can, um, th that we can enforce a, a, an abortion prohibition, but we do need a libertarian legal order to do that. And just because you elect a libertarian to government doesn't mean that you have established a libertarian legal order. So that's where I draw the line is if it's going to be authoritarian, if it's going to be draconian, then no, but that's not libertarianism. So the next question, which again, a number of people have no, asked, can goes, I, back, can I, can goes back to Judd. But sure, Judd, if you wanted to quickly respond first, but then the, yeah. as you follow on from your response, uh, people just yeah. wanted you to elaborate on why you think that birth is the threshold and you would disagree with the argument of those who would say consciousness or three years. I mean, which was actually and the, um, the Australian philosopher who... Um, the name just escapes me, who you know, popularized that argument under the ethical view that you know, even three years in infanticide is, accept, is morally acceptable. And I've been to libertarian conferences and I've heard that being defended. So the, the uh, person, so the, the question that you were asked was, why, would, why exactly is that where you would draw the line where personhood or whatever it is is? But first answer, Kerry, and respond to Kerry and then you can answer that question. Yeah, actually, it's it's the same topic. Uh, Carrie mentioned that conception is where rights begin, and she gave a scientific explanation for that, where uh, you have now DNA from uh, uh, the woman and the male uh, coming together and making independent um, actions. And that's really interesting because sperm make independent actions too. They're all uh, swimming around trying to find, get to the egg. And not all of them make it. In fact, almost none of them make it. Billions of sperm sadly die all the time. Uh, uh, every, every woman has, uh, I actually don't know the number, uh, no, hundreds just, of them. Uh, just, there's actually a really easy answer to this, which is that none of those things are human life, though. They're alive and they may be I, self directed, but they're not humans. Well, well, and the thing, the thing is, Judd, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the thing is, is that they don't fall under the six criterion of the living organism, which are that they, that they must be complex and highly organized. They must maintain homeostasis. They must acquire and convert nutrient molecules. They must exhibit growth and development. They must reproduce, which the zygote does through mitosis, and they must evolve. So um, the individual uh, cells, which uh, the unfertilized state of the um, of the unfertilized egg and the sperm, those don't even qualify as a living organism. So that's a completely different category than, than the zygote. I don't know. Really quickly, sorry to interrupt. This is a, a fascinating conversation, but we are 10 minutes away from the end of this conversation, and then the next breakout will break out. So your best points, please uh, get them up. All right, please. Okay, well, I was just, I'm just in the middle of saying that... Uh, I, I don't see uh, the, the fact that the sperm meets the egg as, as a beginning threshold of life. Sperm move around, they're pretty aggressive, and they're trying to find an egg. Uh, th they, have, they have a motivation too, and most of them fail in, in their mission. Uh, and and I, I don't, I, obviously, we're all in agreement that we shouldn't criminalize all those billions of sperm that have passed. I also don't believe we should be criminalizing zygotes that pass. Most abortions happen in the first trimester anyway when it is just a very uh, small developing clump of cells. But that's not the, the ultimate crux of it. Very few abortions occur after the, the first trimester. That's a reality. Uh, it, doesn't, it does not rep resemble a baby in any way at that point. But I, I, I fully take the position of it is totally okay to end, an end a fetus any time before birth, at any point, openly, just because for any reason whatsoever, just because uh, whether, you, whether you just want to schedule your birth correctly or whatnot, it, it's a personal decision. It is, not, um, it is not something that I believe that others can impose on us. I believe that there should be more abortion clinics available to, to serve the needs of women. Women do want to, uh, to, to get abortions. There's a clear demand for that. 
and it should be serviced and it should be serviced openly and without apology. I'm not and even just straight pro-choice, pro-abortion. I think pro abortion is a very good thing, a very healthy thing, a very helpful thing for our society and a helpful thing for people's lives. And my morality is based off human flourishing. I believe abortion helps aid in human flourishing. I, I, I had a campaign with McAfee, our motto was let life live. People thought that that was some kind of pro-life motto for some reason, and I understand that. I believe in let life live is about, about the individual humans that are living. I think it's moral to support abortion, but I'm pro-choice because I'm okay with the fact that people might not take that choice, and I support that. I'm, my, only, my only interaction with this with regard to the libertarians is simply don't bring the government involved. I have my own reasons why I think abortion is, is not only okay, but actually a very positive, hugely beneficial thing that should be supported and cherished. But that, but that doesn't, people don't have to agree with me on that. All I'm asking for from other libertarians is you don't bring government into it at, at the point of passing through the birth canal when a fetus separates and becomes an individual. Until then, there is no individual rights to defend. My, um, as we are unfortunately running out of time, because um, my last question to the panelists, and thank you for once again being relatively polite and you know, taking this in good spirit um, for, di for a diff difficult topic is, do you think there are areas that there can be common ground that can still be found? And somebody, I may can ask a question, can libertarians still all unite and agree upon the fact that there shouldn't be laws um, requiring doctors to provide services against their conscience or taxpayer funding for this? Is that something libertarians can agree on? Somebody else uh, said, can libertarians agree that even if you are pro-choice, that Roe v. Wade was incorrectly decided and it should still be a state rights issue like Ruth Bader Ginsburg has actually in fact argued. So they're more sort of pro-choice sorry, pro-life arguments that there could be consensus for, but maybe that there are other things that Stephanie and Kerry, that you think Judd has said that, you know, you, you might think the pro-choice, so, so the pro-life side needs to do a better job at finding consensus. So for our last sort of three minutes, the, my question is, it was sort of a brief comment from each of you before we finish on if there is some sort of way that rather than being at very opposite sides of this debate that libertarians can find something that they can we can all sort of agree on and work together on starting with you stephanie sure i i i'll be very curious to hear i think the question as it was formulated was mostly for judd because um you know it's whether or not basically pro choicers should libertarian pro choicers should be willing to get behind these things like um, you, know, you know, no government funding or, and whatnot. Um, so I'll be curious to hear what he says. I, I think the answer, my answer no from whether, what? No government funding. <laughs> the, and the other things too, uh, I, I mean, I would love to hear you weigh in, weigh in on them, see if we can get to some common ground. For from my perspective, the thing I said at the very end of my opening remarks would be my answer, which is I think that pro-life, pro-lifers often do not sufficiently um, value the lessons from history about the evils of top-down prohibition on a population that doesn't that doesn't share the sort of that, that isn't on board with the at a cultural level with with the thing being almost you know universally wrong so we can outlaw murder because virtually everyone in our society agrees that it is wrong um, that condition doesn't obtain with abortion right now and so i think we have to be, be focused on cultural change before we can be talking about changing the laws. So that's that's an example of a, a thing I think where pro-lifers should do a better job of, of sort of conceding some ground. Um, there are a lot of other things that I would not concede, but um, but that that is I think an important one. John? Yeah, I, I think that uh, libertarians have so much to do and so many things to change and it's sad that this is, is such a violently divisive issue among libertarians which is why i have that agree to disagree my attitude is that the pro pro-lifers are like uh it's like the uh animal rights activists of the right they're they're uh they're supporting something they care about uh, and they're, they're showing that they're you know that they uh uh, their views, I don't want to use the term virtue signaling, but it's not much different than that. This is not something that's materially affecting our world 
in a in a harm in a negative way, we should put this issue aside and just like drop the abortion issue, let people live, don't bring government involved in, involved in the matter, and just uh, support your personal views and share your personal views. Just leave government out of this so we don't have to actually fight with each other. Let it be a non-government problem. Kerry? Well, I think, um, you know, libertarianism has the non-aggression principle. And so government does get involved when there's a rights violation. Um, but I want to talk about common ground because I do think that's important. Um, so at the beginning of this, I sort of divided this into three aspects. You had the le legal philosophical, which is where we had a majority of the discussion over rights and how to establish them. Uh, you have the legal enforcement aspect, which I do believe libertarians actually agree, agree upon. We don't agree with the war on drugs. We don't agree with tough on crime policies. And uh, we do agree with, with some of those more classical liberal principles. Um, so that's an area that, that we can agree with as far as uh, the foundations for a libertarian legal order. Uh, but finally, we have the free market. And I think that if we were to see the division of pro-choice and pro-life as a specialization of labor, where one side is motivated to, um, to find solutions that um, uh, prevent unwanted pregnancies, and where the pro-life side uh, or that segment of society is trying to offer more life-affirming choices uh, in a situation where you don't have, you know, the federal funding, which again, I do think that we agree on, you don't have the, the regulations of, uh, you know, telling doctors that they have to, hi, um, <laughs> that they have to, um, you know, perform certain, certain practices and things like that. Um, you have a free market where people are free to make those choices. We are free to be persuasive. We are free to innovate and compete with uh, abortion clinics. And that is definitely something I think that we can uh, uh, have common ground on. So I would say that we already have common ground on two of those three aspects that I discussed. And uh, I think certainly the first thing that we need more than anything is a freed market. So we unfortunately have to close this Zoom out. I hope you found this interesting. And once again, thank you very much to our three panelists for taking on such a difficult issue. And I think you'll all agree did a wonderful job of it. So thank you very much, Stephanie, Judd and Kerry. Thank you.